Hello and welcome to The Intentional Clinician. I'm your host, Paul Kraus, Licensed Professional Counselor. Today I'm going to be interviewing Sivi Sukerman. Sivi Sukerman received her master's degree in clinical psychology from the Chicago School of Professional Psychology in 2007 and has practiced in community mental health, crisis services, school-based mental health, residential, and women's health agencies. Currently, Sivi has a full-time private practice in the West Seattle neighborhood of Seattle and has been in private practice for three and a half years. She is also a certified mindful schools instructor and a level two little flower yoga teacher. In addition, she has received a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree in acting with an emphasis in original works from Cornish College of the Arts in 1998. Welcome, Sivi. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Excellent. I'm very excited to have you on the podcast. And we've got some very interesting topics coming up today. And before we jump into those, we're going to do an icebreaker. Uh, But I, I want to tell the guests we will be discussing the universal teachings of Buddhist psychology and some of the differences and similarities between secular and Buddhist mindfulness and the implications for counseling, which this show is about. And I just wanted to throw you a question before we break into the icebreaker, which is, can someone who has no religion or who is very devout in a Western religion like Christianity or or if a Muslim or anyone else, can they... Um, read and learn about Buddhist psychology and feel that their, you know, their religion or isn't being, I don't know, interfered with? Threatened, sure. Well, considering that I was raised Jewish and I consider myself an atheist, Mm -hmm. uh, from that perspective, I would say yes. Um, Without getting too deep into it, um, First of all, what I can say is that when we look at Western views of religion, um, they're all theistic. Now, Buddhism as a religion or a philosophy or a psychology of the mind, it's a non-theistic, quote-unquote, religion. Um, All it means is that God is not a part of that religion. So it's just, it's a very different way of looking at religion than I think people in the West are used to. Um, To me, it's more of a philosophy or a psychology of the mind. Um, So, you know, I've worked with Mormon clients, Catholic clients, Christian clients, Muslim clients, atheist clients, and clients who identify as Buddhist, um, or, and also Hindu clients. Um, And everyone has been able to I guess, um, utilize what I'm working with them while also maintaining their faith or lack thereof. So I don't see a problem with that. Excellent. I couldn't have asked for a better answer. Uh, that was my impression. And we'll get into that when we get into the lightning round that Buddhism, um, in most sects can be either a philosophy or a religion or just a psychology, depending on what you want. And it's not demanding, uh, unless you're in certain sects of Buddhism, it's not demanding certain things of you. Is that correct in terms of? Yeah, I, I believe that to be correct. I can't speak for every lineage or every sect sure, of sure. Buddhism. But I can say in the learning that I've done, on uh, the study and research that I've done, um, you know, sort of the foundation of Buddhism is not about belief per se. Mm-hmm. Um, it's about simply paying attention, uh, to the reality. Um, and in the philosophy, it, it even states like, don't just believe this. I'm not asking you to believe anything. Sure. You know, it's, it's about engaging, um, engaging with the world in a certain way where you are noticing your lens, uh, and able to see things as they are. Um, I know we'll get more into this, so I don't want to get too heady with it too early. Well, essentially, I just wanted to summarize this little pre-section into saying that whatever your faith or non-faith is, this can be a philosophy for you or an approach to psychology, and that's kind of how we're using it. Um, I don't, are you Buddhist, by the way? You're atheist. You're asking You're atheist, right? I'm atheist, but I I, I think that those things can coexist. Right, exactly. uh, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. So I do consider myself Buddhist. 
Um, but to me, in the way that I look at it, it doesn't feel like a religious thing. Sure. It feels like a chosen philosophy for my life that seems to make a lot of sense and has helped me a lot and has helped my clients. Excellent. So I really appreciate your openness. And I know that you're becoming an expert slash are an expert depends on who's talking about you, because I know that you might not want to be called an expert in this, but I happen to think you are. So there I'm calling you that. Um, I actually am not Buddhist. Myself, I have my own sort of personal faith that I don't want to get into because that'd be a whole other podcast. But I, and I don't want to put labels on me because then there's assumptions and we're not going to go there. But anyway, the point is, is I've I've been to reading, I've read some Buddhist psychology books um, about how to use it in counseling, and I found it very useful. And I've found it non-threatening to uh, other religions and very open and inclusive to um, all religions or non-religions, which is why I really like the philosophy because it's not, uh, it does not appear to um, compete or demand or say you have to do these things. It just gives you ideas. And so I think that's a cool thing for all our listeners. I want to just throw that out there so they don't just hit stop right now. So anyway, with no, without further ado, Let's just, we're going to get all, you're going to do your talk. I'm going to ask you about this. Let's get into the icebreaker. So, uh, yeah, how do we know each other? Well, Paul, as you know, we went to graduate school together in Chicago. And now we're in totally, well, we've been in very different parts of the country for quite a while now, but it's so nice that we've kept in touch. Absolutely. I'm very glad we've kept in touch. And, uh, yeah, we've kept in touch pretty much the whole time and kind of been on a, Similar journey, both of us in community mental health, working in crisis situations, and then now both private practice. Almost, we almost started around the same time. I was in Phoenix, Arizona at the time, where I lived for nine years after Chicago for a while, and you had moved to Seattle. And I remember, uh, I was I started my private practice, and then I think you called me or something, and you said, "What? Tell me about this. I I uh, I love my job, but I just am so tired all the time." And I said, "Tell me about it." I said I something like, yeah. you know, all I'm doing is paperwork here working for this public mental health. And I love helping these people. But it's this paperwork is tiring me out. I really want to try something new. So I did that. And then I and you I don't remember. I think you followed right after or you had already been doing it. I can't remember. But anyway, we worked. We talked about it. And then the next thing you know, you're like the most in demand, uh, you know, mindfulness teacher in Seattle. And now we're moving into Buddhist psychology. But anyway, that's my memory of it. Well, And not to get too far off track, but if you remember, you helped edit one of my first graduate school papers on (laughs) Buddhist psychology. Do you remember that? I remember editing a paper, but I didn't remember it was on Buddhist psychology. It was on a Mark Epstein book, I believe, Thoughts Without a Thinker. Oh. For our theories of counseling class. Well, this was, what, 12 years ago? Yeah. Yeah. And you helped me because I had no academic background because, as you mentioned in my intro, uh, I was a theater artist. I went to, you know, I have a BFA in acting. Um, and so when I went to graduate school, I really felt like, uh, I had no academic experience walking in the door. And so, you know, as one of our professors so eloquently said to me, Sivvy, you're a great, great creative writer, but this isn't creative writing. So you helped me a lot, uh, oh. in learning how to write academic papers. And the first one was Buddhist psychology. Well, I, I feel very, very happy to to have you remind me of that. I do like, I, I love catching up with uh, you and, and old friends because all these memories that I don't remember at all, all of a sudden spring into existence. And I, I love that. And I, I mean, uh, I would say, yeah, that was, I remember I was quite a writing nerd at that time. And I, I'm glad that I helped you. And uh, I know you helped me in many ways, which we won't totally get into in this podcast, but, you know, you worked at a, a, a good coffee shop slash bar that I would frequent on my way home. And we had many of good chats uh, with helping me with stress of my life, which was helpful. Yeah. So I appreciate that. So obviously that was very helpful. And uh, yeah, anyway, we've met up since then in Seattle and Chicago and different things. And um, anyway, but uh, this isn't totally about our nostalgia for the listeners. Now they have a background. Give me uh before we jump into the total topic, can you this is an open question, so I just want to know a little bit about your story. You don't have to tell your life story because I don't have time for that, but something about where, how, where, did, how did you get to where you are now 
or what brought you to this philosophy or what brought you into counseling, whatever kind of avenue you want to take with that. Yeah, I'm going to try to make this not a life story. Um, so <laughs> it's hard. I can be very verbose. You know that about me. I can me. hit this be bell. I'll hit the bell if you go over time. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You have five um, minutes. So, you know, coming from a life in the theater, <clears throat> while I, while I, uh, the re- part of the, the main reason why I did theater was because of what I thought it could have as an impact on people, telling somebody's story. Uh, being a witness to something, uh, the shared experience of theater. I worked with a lot of new playwrights. I really enjoyed directing. Um, I'm a published playwright myself. And when it became clear to me that that lifestyle was just not for me, you know, I lived in New York City for four years. Um, When it became clear that that lifestyle was not for me, I really did a lot of reflecting on what I want to be in this world and what's important to me. And this actually coincides with my interest in Buddhism. Um, And again, not to go deep into this, but I was two blocks away from the Twin Towers on September 11th. And it was a really rough time for me. Um, And someone gave me a book by Pema Chodron, who's a famous Buddhist nun. Um, And I recommend this book to everybody. Uh, When Things Fall Apart is the name of the book. And I read that book and it just really changed me. And I think all of that culminating of figuring out, you know, I was in my late twenties, figuring out my identity, what I wanted to do in this world, having that life changing traumatic experience that showed me the fragility of our lives. Um, it just led to a lot of self-reflection on what I wanted to do. And so over the next two years, I slowly began to prepare myself for, um, uh, my master's degree where I met you um, and got really into Buddhism and Buddhist psychology and started reading Jack Kornfield. I also got really into the existentialists at that time too, but that's a whole nother story. <laughs> right. um, that's podcast but, uh, three or two. That I think is sort of in a nutshell, my path. Um, I have just always found Buddhist philosophy to be profoundly um, interesting and true. Um, and my introduction to it was back in 2001. Yes, thank you for thank you for uh, sharing that. I I do remember, you know, if we had another podcast to talk about trauma, I remember being riveted as you told me the long version of the 9/11 story, and I think that actually would be a good story maybe to put into writing someday or or something because I, I remember I still remember to this day all pretty much all the details of it from you, like your perspective, not mine. Yeah. I remember mine, but I was not, I was in Michigan at the time. I was not two blocks away and not covered with ash. So, um, I, I, I appreciate you sharing that. Life changes us. What's that? We choose how we, we are changed by it. That's true. That's true. So, yeah, I think that's, I'm glad that you shared your background on that. I, I would love to now turn it over to you a little bit and, this show is, of course, the Intentional Clinician. We're talking about counseling and psychology, different approaches. We're trying to demystify it for uh, your everyday listener and for clinicians, uh, expose the clinicians to new ideas or topics that they can <clears throat> use in their practices. Uh, so we're kind of just talking to everybody. So uh, tell us about Buddhist psychology. And that's what I'm going to say. Tell us about Buddhist psychology. There we go. That's a good introduction. <laughs> Wow, that's not broad at all. <laughs> um, and I do want to apologize. I'm getting over a cold. <clears throat> so there's going to be some coughing, perhaps, like there just was. It's um, okay. I might be able to edit it out with supersonic skill. We'll find all out. All right. Um, so tell us about Buddhist psychology. Well, I think probably the place that makes the most sense to start, uh, because it's such a buzzword, would be mindfulness. Um, because that is sort of the core, um, thing I think that people associate with Buddhist psychology. And right now it's probably the trendiest part. And I do think that mindfulness opens up the door for, um, to experience other aspects of the philosophy. So if we talk about mindfulness, um, 
everybody's got their own definition. The definition I use with my clients uh, is it's simply noticing whatever you're experiencing in the present moment on purpose and with kindness and curiosity. A lot of people are familiar with the John Kabat-Zinn. If you're familiar with him and his MBSR work, uh, he talks about it in a similar way, but he says non-judgmentally at the end. And a lot of people look at it as a non-judgmental awareness. For me personally, and this probably comes from, you know, my embracing of the whole Buddhist philosophy, the reason I changed it in my own definition from non-judgmental awareness to uh, being aware with kindness and curiosity is because what I noticed when I started meditating and doing this practice was that I was told not to judge myself, let's say during a meditation, and then I would notice a judgment coming up, and then I would start judging myself for judging myself, and I'd get into this loop, but I'm like, all right, well, how do I how do I relate to this in a way that then doesn't become judgmental of the judgment? Uh, and I was at a conference, and I heard a woman use the terms kindness and curiosity, and I went, aha, I, lo- I so much prefer directing me in a way of how should I approach this versus what not to do. Um, so looking at being able to approach our thoughts, our experiences, um, our sensations with kindness and curiosity to me is the cornerstone of mindfulness. And when you, so if you look at meditation uh, and in, in sort of the, the work that I do and in the, um, the type of meditation and mindfulness that I teach comes from what the Buddhists call Vipassana practice, which mm-hmm. uh, means insight meditation. Um, so there, there is a process through in which you start with Vipassana being a Samatha practice of focused attention on the breath, noticing when your mind starts to go somewhere, gently bringing it back to the breath. It goes away again. It comes back. Our minds are very busy. That's what they do. We don't have to judge it. It can come back. So that's the first step in cultivating the right frame of mind to then move on to insight. Mm, Okay. Within the insight practice, and this is actually where I think a lot of clinicians fall short. So I want this to be a pretty major point that we're talking about. It's not just about concentration and focus, and it's not just about relaxation, though it can be a very relaxing experience to meditate. What people often find is is that it's the total opposite of that, (laughs) and it's very uncomfortable, and they're bored and they're restless, and all these things are happening. Um, So what we can learn as we get deeper into the practice of insight building is that as thoughts arise, I can choose to hook into them and follow that train and make them part of my identity or some permanent fixture, um, or I can unhook from them and come back into the moment Mm -hmm. and engage with what is actually happening in front of me and what is real versus what is a story or a narration of the mind. And there doesn't have to be any, again, there doesn't have to be any judgment around that. Sure. It's simply being able to notice what's arising and giving ourselves a choice in how we deal with it. Now, connecting that with Buddhism are concepts of impermanence, Mm -hmm. concepts of desire, grasping, attachment, identification. Mm -hmm. Um, And through these practices and through the philosophy, what we learn is that, um, An emotional state doesn't last forever. Ah, yes. Ah, yes. It's not a permanent state. So we're very good at at identifying with it and trying to hold on to it. Uh, And impermanence is a major concept in Buddhism. So allowing things to flow. Let me summarize here for a moment. So you kind of just walked us through mindfulness a little bit and then brought it to a deeper place where we're looking for insight, is kind of what I heard. And a lot of people, if you haven't meditated, sometimes the best way to start is with kind of maybe a guided meditation like mindfulness-based stress reduction where it's just kind of helping you learn how to breathe and pay attention to the breath. And then eventually getting into the point where it's silent and you're actually trying to listen for insight. Is that what you were saying? But not grasping into the thoughts? Yeah. 
So it's, it's very, it's a process. Um, when you first start learning mindfulness meditation, Vipassana, whatever you want to call it, insight meditation, the first step is just sort of being able to recognize where your attention is. That's really the first step. Am I present? Am I in my thoughts? We spend so much time in our thoughts without realizing it. Yeah. I've had so many clients when I'll sit and I'm introducing them to this and we'll maybe do like five minutes. I'll have, I've had so many clients be like, Oh my goodness. I had no idea how busy my mind was. Like I was going from thought to thought, to thought, to thought, to thought. And it's this awakening of, wow, I had no idea. So just being able to develop that awareness is the first step, but it's not all that mindfulness is. And that's where I want to make a distinction between, I think, when I see clinicians using mindfulness as a technique Mm -hmm. for relaxation um, or for uh, simply learning to pay attention versus the long game, which is, okay, once I start noticing all these things that are happening, how can I learn to start to relate to it differently? How can I learn to relate to my thoughts differently, Uh, which would be different than a cognitive behavioral approach of changing your thoughts or reframing them? Sure. Mindfulness and insight-based work is saying, can I allow them to be there without fighting with them, without hooking into them, without grasping them, and start to see them as what they are, which is a thought? Because what we know about the brain is that those thoughts aren't just going to magically go away. And so getting into an argument with them all the time, I personally don't see as all that helpful. What I do see as helpful is learning to relate to them, be kind to them, and be curious about them. Hence the kindness curiosity piece. So one comment before we jump into the Buddhist psychology portion, which has some of the philosophy on bringing us to the long game, but I like the short game versus the long game because I totally agree that sometimes in the short term, we do need to learn some relaxation skills and some attention skills to be able to kind of get out of acute anxiety or acute depression or PTSD and just sort of get grounded. But then you're right, what happens next? Because, and no offense to cognitive behavioral therapy, but I think that cognitive behavioral therapy is kind of like going and getting a cast on your leg. It works for a little while, but then if you don't keep the cast on there and you don't develop the muscle on the leg, you get atrophy. So... I don't want to have to, you know, it's good to to learn it, but I, I don't feel like it, it promotes the long-term change people are looking for when they come to us. I do think that the meta-awareness, learning the meta-awareness, that's what I call it, when you can hear your own thoughts and understand you are not your thoughts, which I believe is detachment or something, some concept related to that. And then the long game, exactly, developing a relationship with yourself in a way where you're able to hear your mind going off about all sorts of things and instead of being angry at your mind or yelling at it or berating it or trying to make it stop then you become curious move alongside those thoughts or move, or feelings or whatever they are <clears throat> and learn from them and then eventually get to the point and I don't know exactly how I'm going to say this correctly but get to a point where they're not causing you a lot of strife or stress and they are okay yeah i had that thought it made me sad and okay well i'm still not going to go alter my behavior and do something i used to do that wasn't very good for me i'm going to do something different but it's not because i changed the thought it's because my relationship with the thought is different is that what you're saying yeah and in buddhism you hear the terms like skillful versus unskillful right okay when we have that choice of how what we're going to do with the thought is when i can see things clearly And the choice is in front of me and I'm not being driven by an emotional attachment to it. But when I can just really, as an observer, see what's happening, the choice between what will be helpful and skillful versus what will be unhelpful or unskillful, I think, becomes a lot more clear. Excellent. So I think we've got the meta awareness and the beginning of mindfulness sort of opened up. I'd like to have you introduce some of the concepts you were talking about, like impermanence, attachment, grasping, identification. I actually found those very useful from Jack Cornfield's book, The Wise Heart. I think he talks a lot about them. And um, I read I that, book. that book. I love, I that, love book. that book. 
he got me hooked. I saw him talk with Dan, uh, Dr. Dan Siegel, um, a neuro uh, neurobiology guy who's yeah. neuropsychiatrist who started the Norton series on neurobiology, which is amazing. We have a lot of brain research backing counseling and mindfulness and all of these practices. And so if you're a reader, go out there and get it. But uh, him and Dan Siegel talked about, Jack Kornfield and Dan Siegel talked about this. I think it was 2010 I saw them. And I was immediately drawn into it and I was so excited. And it helped me actually personally learn the nature of my thinking and 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 be able to understand it more. So I'd love for you to explain to us some of these concepts that we could we can learn learn from. Absolutely. So it all starts from the idea that you're gonna there is suffering in life. So a lot of people think Buddhism is really like a downer. <laughs> right. <laughs> I've heard people say that like, oh all it talks about is suffering, you know, like oh we're all suffering. But it's true, and it's it's partially to me about just embracing that as part of our human experience, and it's a shared experience. Everybody suffers. That is a human experience, and it actually can connect us and help us have compassion. Once we have compassion for our own suffering, it makes it a lot easier to have compassion for other people's suffering. Uh, compassion is a huge part of the work that I do too. Um, I don't know how much time we'll have. That's a whole, that could be a whole other podcast. Okay. Podcast um, too. Got notes yeah. for that. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'll be a regular Paul. All right. Um, I'm all about it. So if we start with impermanence, what we learn in meditation, and then you can generalize that into your life because you start paying more attention <laughs> and noticing this is that things aren't perfect. Things aren't permanent. One of my um, favorite teachers that I've had, I guess I can plug him on here. He's an amazing guy. His name is Vinny Ferraro. Uh, he gave me a pin a few years back at a retreat. And on that pin, it said, right now it's like this. Mm. And I still have it. I have it in a drawer in my buffet in my dining room. <laughs> and I'll, it's because uh, I don't want to lose it. Uh, and to me, that that's it. Right now, it's like this. And if you can remember that every right now is a new moment, you realize that there's the opportunity for that to shift and change and that life is fluid and we're not stuck unless we choose to be stuck in a moment. I think there has been some research and I might be totally messing this up, but something like an actual human emotion, if left alone, will last maybe 12 seconds. Oh, but wow. people think there's a great interview actually between Sam Harris and Joseph Goldstein on Sam Harris's podcast, Waking Up. Okay. Joseph Goldstein's another a great meditation teacher. Right. And he said himself that, you know, if a lot of people think that they can be mad for a week straight, and it's because they're allowing their thoughts, which they're not really even aware of, to keep making that moment again and again about something that's happened before. It's not even happening right now, but they're, they're still angry about it in this moment, even though there could be like, uh, I almost said clown, but people hate clowns. There could be <laughs> like a cute little puppy dog sitting right in front of them. Right. That could make them so full of joy, yet they're repeating something in their mind that happened a week ago, and they're still angry about it. Even though that is it, they're, they're creating permanency out of something that's not permanent. And when we sit with our, ourselves in meditation, we can start over time as we gain insight, we can start to see these patterns of how our thoughts might be unskillful and how um, we're, cre we're making permanency where it doesn't belong. And we're not allowing a new moment to change us, you know? So Does on that a, make sense? Yeah, totally. So on a base okay. level, I've heard the term from uh, Buddhist psychology that life is suffering and we're accepting that. And if you accept that, if you come from that paradigm, we're accepting um, that we're all going to go through different pains in our life and we're all going to die. And so there, from there, it, it, it by accepting that, then we are able to see things how it is in the moment in some way and be able to see things as passing or impermanent and thus not get, we are, we have a choice to not get hung up on things as much or, 
or not getting hung, get hung up on bad things that happen to us almost at all and, and be able to frame them in a certain way versus I feel that growing up in the United States in our Western mindset, uh, we, we hate suffering. I mean, we have whole, yeah. we have whole industries dedicated to your comfort temperature uh, you know, I, I could keep going, but what I mean is that I feel like we also are in a death denial culture, um, where we don't want to, we don't want to think about death. We don't want to talk about death. It's not, I mean, people do talk about it, but I feel that, you know, the advertising, the marketing, different things you see, it's sort of like, I don't know. Did you, do you get where I'm going with this? I think I'm losing it, but. Well, no, no, no. I, I get where you're going. What I would just say <clears throat> is that, from a Buddhist framework, yes, there, there's suffering that you can't control. That's sure. part of the human condition. Right. We're all going to get sick. We're all going to die. These are things that are outside of our grasp. I mean, there's, it's just what it means to be a human being. Sure. The thing is, is that we create a lot more suffering than we need to. Okay, yes, very good. There we go. So by grasping, by trying to make the impermanent permanent, especially, you know, when we get spun out on our negative thinking or unhelpful and skillful thoughts um, and we let it drive our behavior and our relationships, we end up creating all this suffering that doesn't actually have to be there. So it's saying, yeah, there is suffering in life. Absolutely. And like I said, that's a shared human experience. It should bond us with each other. Um, but when we create our own suffering, which usually stems from the concept of wanting things to be different from how they are, or as uh, I call it, denying reality, fighting <laughs> reality, which you're never going to win, which is the, this shouldn't be like this, why me, you know, all that stuff. When you, when you can't accept reality as it stands, and it may suck, like it might not be fun, I, you know, I get that. Sure. It, there's a point of, you're not going to, it doesn't mean you have to like it. But you have to accept that th those are the parameters that you're working within. And once you can accept that, then you can take action. And if you want to do something to try to make it better, that's great. But sitting and spinning on how awful it is, number one, isn't helping you or anybody else. And it's, it's, not, it's not doing anything. And the only person that's suffering from that is you. And, and in fact, bringing in some neurobiology, if you sit and spin on how awful things are, you're actually creating new neural networks that will make it easier for you to access the negative emotions and more difficult to access positive emotions when good things do happen to you. Is that correct? I think so. Well, because, because you know, humans have a negativity bias anyway, well, but yeah. I use, I think it's sort of what you're saying. This, I'm a metaphor person. My, I see images all the time in my head, um, is that and I often use this metaphor with clients. You know, imagine you're standing on a beach with a big stick and you've been standing there your whole life digging the same line in the sand with that same stick over and over and over again. That groove is going to be pretty deep and that stick is going to fit really nicely in that groove. And yeah, water might come up and try to, you know, fill it up, but that groove is so deep that it's going to take a while for that groove to go away. So what we're trying to do in therapy is move to a different part of the beach and start a different groove. And it's going to be real easy to want to go back to that first one because it's there. But we have to make the choice to try and create that new pathway. And, you know, you've brought up Dan Siegel. And, I, you know, I base that a lot on the stuff that I've read of his work and the interpersonal neurobiology and all the great information that's coming out about the connection between mindfulness and mindfulness-based practices and uh, the effects on the brain and neuroplasticity and, you know, so yeah, I totally agree with you. And I want to get some more examples of you of some, uh, Buddhist psychology concepts we can use. I just want to ask, I, I believe that not, so we've accepted that life is suffering, but sometimes we also don't accept that life changes. So for instance, we have a, uh, we go through a season of time where we're really in this awesome, fun uh, everything's working out, having a lot of pleasure, and then we uh, we go. Wait a minute, this is great. I've made it. I, I want to be here, so I'm going to grasp this pleasure. And I'm going to just suck the life out of this pleasure, and I'm going to keep doing this. And, and sometimes then that causes pain because we're not accepting that. Okay, this season's over. You've graduated college. You need to. You know, I don't know what I'm joking. That was a joke, but yeah, yeah, no, you know, no, no, no. We, we can't. And that comes back to impermanence, right? We we're, we're going into a different phase of life, and and that's not all in our control. Part of it has to do with our age. Part of it has to do with 
all sorts of different, I like to use the pie metaphor. So whatever's happening to us, there's probably about 16 to 32 slices of pie that can explain it, going from your biology to your social, to your spiritual, to your environment, to neurobiology, to epigenetics, to your functional systems and your organs, to your personality, to your parents, your grandparents, etc. But what I'm saying yeah. is that we're not recognizing that something is moving us here. And so we've got to hang on to the pleasure. And then that causes pain. So can you explain why? Well, this goes in the concept of grasping and desire. Um, and it, for me, it connects back to the idea of not accepting things as they are, wanting things to be different. So when you try to hold on to something that's not meant to be held on to forever because we're moving forward, I think that's what you're talking about. You're not allowing new moments to arise. So, you know, there's a concept in Buddhism around reincarnation, for instance. And this, um, depending on, again, your lineage, your sect, or your belief system, again, they don't teach you that you have to believe anything. Because um, I heard a great Dharma talk about reincarnation that I really loved and I think connects with what you're saying is that what if instead of reincarnation being that you're actually like reborn into a new body you know, forever, whatever, sure. until you meet, you know, hit nirvana or enlightenment. What if it's each moment is a reincarnation? Oh. What if we can live moment to moment? I mean, again, it's not just like living for the moment. That's different. Sure. That's going to be a very selfish way to live. <laughs> but what if we can allow each moment to potentially to change us and because if you allow that each, and again, it goes along with impermanence, moment to moment of letting an experience change you because we're not the same. Um, in Buddhism also has a concept of like there is no self, which a lot of people have a hard time with. And all it's saying is that there's no static self. A great example is if I showed you a picture of you, Paul, uh, from when you were five years old, would you say that that's you? I mean, it was me at like some point. Do you identify with that five-year-old? No, I do not identify with the five-year-old. I say, what the heck? You were really cute. Yeah. What happened? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> um, no, because you have grown and changed. That self, it's a different self. You it, are not your five-year-old self. I don't know how old you are now. Uh, you're your whatever your old plus self 30. you are. What? Plus 30. Okay, I'm plus 40, so, okay. you know, 40, we're good. 35, yeah. Um, yeah. So I think one of the hard things talking about Buddhist psychology and philosophy is the fact that there's so many overlapping ideas. It's kind of like we can talk about one thing and then it starts to overlap into something else. Uh, and I'm not going to go into specifics of the Eightfold Path or the Four Noble Truths. or I mean, We're kind of talking around it. Sure. But I'm coming from more of a clinical perspective where – I'm not teaching a religions class in my office. I'm right. teaching a philosophical approach to life and a psychology of the mind that I find is really helpful uh, in alleviating, especially anxiety, which is probably 90% of what's in my office and depression and even ADHD and, and other clinical issues. And so I don't feel the need to get into all really, you know, teaching Buddhism sure. as much as looking at the concepts around are we so tied into an identity that we have that we're having a really hard time shifting out of it? Are we so attached to our anxiety as much as we don't like it? Because that's how we've identified ourselves. That's the self that we see, but it's hard to even see outside of that. And can we become an observer to that experience and realize that that identity is not fixed? So excellent. So here's a good example. When I look out my window here, I can see trees that have uh, just started to experience some very cold weather here in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and they are dropping their leaves and they are going into hibernation for the winter. And uh, well, they're still alive, you know, and then in the spring, when lots of rain and sunshine starts coming out again, they're going to grow new leaves. And I'm not a biologist, but anyway, the point is, that, and then this summer and so we're going through the seasons, and it seems to me that plants and animals have a real easy time accepting reality. Uh, and as humans, we, we're like, no, I don't like this season. 
I don't like this. I mean, our seasons are a little bit more complex because it could be an anxious season or depression season or bereavement season or self-doubt season or a failed relationship season. But if we accept that, and that's the scary part, if we accept that, I, I've seen a shift in people uh, and myself when I get get real, don't deny reality <laughs> with yeah. myself and say, you know what, you're really just having a really hard time right now with anxiety and you might need to do something about this and you might actually need to stop clicking on Facebook and reading the news for a few weeks and start putting in some intentional practices in your life and 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 then my you know my brain will go no don't you know and, I'll, and but if i listen to all the complaints and all the reasons eventually i might be able to make friends with myself and and be okay with the fact that i've got to leave the season behind and move into a new season um but sometimes we can be in a whole new season and, and think we're in a different season where plants and animals, they don't seem to have that choice. The cold weather's coming. All those squirrels are taking nuts and they're putting them in, in some sort of hole to, uh, because they know cold weather's coming. Uh, it seems they're like they're not sitting there going, "God, I hate this time of year. I don't want to have to gather the acorns." Or right. my friend was saying that that she had a someone a, a squirrel was collecting apples in her garage. Um, they're not sitting there whining about it. I mean, I don't want to say people are just whining, but sure. they're not sitting there spinning on hating it. Mm. They're going, okay, so this is what's happening. So what do I need to do? Right. I mean, so, is that what you're saying? Yeah, That's I'm basically saying happening. they're in the moment and they're accepting what's happening to, as far yeah. as we can tell. Now, they're suffering too, but they're kind of going with what is occurring. And I think that is – and sometimes it takes that quiet, quieting of the mind or maybe coming to a therapist to be able to see what's happening due to various things in your life, especially if you've gone through trauma, you may be – still in shock and not be really realizing what's been happening to you. And so those can be some serious issues and, and take a lot of uh, time and effort to be able to accept what is happening or what did happen, um, to be able to make the changes neurologically and in your life. Thoughts? So trauma, that brings up such a large, I mean, that's big. Trauma's big. Um, so there's a couple of things happening. I mean, and, and I know you know this. There's there's what's happening to the nervous system first sure. of all, which is not in somebody's control. Uh, so when the sympathetic nervous system gets activated to that degree, and you and you see this with anxiety too, but to a greater extent with trauma, is like the somatic issues. Um, we can talk all about the vagus nerve and all of that, but we we know there's there's all these sort of physiological things happening in the body, right? Right. It's trauma. So starting with uh, the psychoeducation around explaining what's happening, and then again, yeah, having someone, a guide with trauma training, and, and at least, you know, what I'm talking about coming from a Buddhist perspective is learning to be able to be an observer of what's happening in the body uh, and start to ground yourself back into your body. Um, and... With that, I would say when we're looking at trauma, um, I'm really fascinated by Peter Levine's work in somatic experiencing, and it connects very much with mindfulness. And I'm actually just starting a whole training program, a three-year training program on that. So I'm not oh, wow. an expert to speak about it, but um, looking at how being kind to our experiences and kind and curious and non-reactive with our experiences um, emotionally, physically, mentally is, is a great, is, is really, really important. Um, with trauma, as far as this work, as far as like the hands-on work, like the skill building, it's kind, it's a little bit of a different beast because there has to be a lot more care in helping the client lean into an experience without losing themselves. We don't want them to feel like we're pushing them off a cliff if they're not ready for that. Um, so whereas a lot of people can handle observing their experience, their, maybe their sensory experience, emotional experience, people that have dealt with trauma, you need to be more careful around how you're guiding them through that and how much you're asking them to lean in and what the cues they need to be paying attention to on when to back off from an experience. You know, if they're going to get, you know, I often talk about like sticking your toe in the water and worrying that you're going to drown. Oh, I don't want right. anybody to drown. Mm -hmm. So that comes back to sort of the clinician uh, using your best judgment and your, your skills.
Yes, absolutely. And I think that is something, side note, before we get back into Buddhist psychology, if something's out of your scope, make sure that you talk about it with your client and also refer out. Um, I often get people working with me who have worked with somebody else and who was not informed, uh, who, who didn't have inform tra trauma-informed background or any education on that and were basically told that they needed to think this way or something was wrong with them. And I said, that uh, that's scary to me. That's therapy. So, so interest. So anyway, if, if you've got trauma, make sure you go to somebody who's got a lot of trauma training. And, and I was going to say, I, I think you can treat trauma from a lot of different perspectives. Um, so I want to get back into the, the, the Buddhist psychology perspective. We've talked about a number of imper uh, concepts, impermanence, attachment, grasping at your thoughts, um, we did we hit up identification? Well, we I did talk about that a little bit when people really identify so much with a state, right? Or an experience that that becomes sort of their identity. So, and we've talked about this in mental health, whether you're part of sort of a mindfulness based approach or not, is you know saying I'm experiencing anxiety or I'm feeling anxious, not I am anxious, right? Or um, you know, I am this, I am that. I do think that the language that we use is really important. Um, so to me, that's what it is, is non-identification. Something can happen and I don't have to fully identify with the experience. Um, and this, this again connects with, you know, when we're spinning on our thoughts or replaying stuff over and over again, um, or forecasting stuff over and over again, this identification with states of being, um, and we often don't even realize that we're doing it. Another metaphor that I use quite often is, you know, with, um, with an emotional experience or thoughts, we can often find ourselves sort of soaking in a bathtub with it where you don't know where you end and the water begins. Uh, and mm -hmm. it's like, you don't even realize that you're there. And mindfulness is the moment of waking up and going, oh my gosh, I'm in the bathtub. Yes. So there's that realization, that recognizing of what's happening. Then there's the stepping out, out of the bathtub so that you can actually be an observer and look at what it is that you've been soaking in mm -hmm. without simultaneously soaking in it. That's, that's the magic is can I observe it without being in it so I can actually be an observer? And then with the ultimate goal, I, I, I let this metaphor go on for a little more. The, the ultimate goal is to be able to take a shower instead of a bath. Ah. So I can unplug the drain. I'll feel things. Experiences will happen to me. They will run their course. I will feel them. I will experience them, suffering and joy and everything else. But I let them continue their path down the drain, and I let the new experience come over me. Instead of plugging it up and just sitting in it. This is, how, this is who I am. This is where I'm at. I'm going to sit here. So learning, and again, right, it's, it comes back to impermanence. It comes back to attachment. Right. All these concepts, in my opinion, are so overlapping. Um, and I personally think, yes, you can understand philosophically by talking about it, but I think having a strong meditation practice and going on a retreat, which is one of the most, the, my first retreat, I have to say, was probably the most painful experience of my life, and I tell clients about it all the time. I had images of myself running, screaming out of the room. I was like, no one can stop me. My car's outside. Because <laughs> sitting with all of those experiences can be so uncomfortable. But that's where all the magic and the learning happens. Um, that's where we learn these concepts. That's where we realize how much we fight our experiences and fight reality. And it wasn't until I finally said to myself, Sivvy, you're just sitting here. <laughs> like, hey, like you have nowhere else to be right now. Can you just, what happens if you just stop fighting this and just allow this to be what's happening right now? And there was such a major lesson in that. So the depth of the work I think you can get to on a retreat, which would go more towards really incorporating a lot of the, the philosophy is very different than what I see a lot of clinicians doing in their offices with mindfulness. And this isn't, you know, I, this isn't me talking bad about anybody, but I've had a number of, of um, 
clients come in and say, oh, yeah, yeah, I've had mindfulness. And I'm like, oh, okay, so tell me, tell me about it. And it was really like a series of relaxation techniques. It was like, focus on your breath. It will calm you down. But there was no look at the greater implications of why, why the heck are we doing this? What are we learning from this? Right. Besides how to maybe engage our parasympathetic nervous system, which is great. Sure. That's great. That's fantastic. That's a great tool. However, while I'm, why I'm so impassioned about connecting the Buddhist philosophy to it is because I think in a lot of ways we're doing our clients a major disservice by not looking at what the breadth of this philosophy and practice actually has for us. I was, I train once or twice a year, um, other mental health providers through a, a local organization here, uh, an all day training on using mindfulness with children and adolescents. And we were talking, I was talking about the non-judgmental awareness and about, um, there's no wrong way to do this. And it's not about just keeping, keeping your attention on the breath. It's, it's about noticing when your mind goes and there's no goal to the practice. There's absolutely no goal to it, except just being with whatever's happening. And this therapist raised her hand, and she, I'll never forget it. She was like, you just blew my mind. That's what she said to me. And I was like, wow, that's pretty impressive. How did I blow your mind? And she said, you know, I've been to all these mindfulness trainings, and I always felt like the, the message was the goal is to focus on the breath. And she said, but that's not what you're, you're saying, the opposite of that. And she goes, and I always felt like I was doing it wrong. And I said, I'm really sorry that that's how you learned this. And that's why I really think that it does the, the whole idea a disservice when we just look at it as a skill or a technique that we're building for, for clients, whether it's, you know, they have ADHD or something and we want them to focus, improve their executive functioning or whatever. Uh, the implications are so much greater than that. And I feel like when we miss the bigger picture of what we're doing, that the clients are really not getting really what mindfulness actually is, which is way more than just attention, way more. I like that. I, I am very inspired by this. Um, and I, I think you can use mindfulness to help people go, confront their emotions to see what's really happening. And then also some of these concepts, one of the concepts you mentioned earlier, and to kind of understand the philosophy here, is that we're all connected in some way. Is that, was it, did I hear you say that? Oh, yeah, the shared human experience. I mean, that, you know, when you look at what the Buddha taught, was that part of the reason that what I've said is that it's not this idea of just, here's this faith, believe in it. What he said was, here, you know what? I've been, like, sitting under this tree, like, meditating, and I've noticed all these things. I'm going to guess that if you do it, you'll notice the same thing. Don't take my word for it. Uh, is what he said. Don't take my word for it. Go live your life and see what you notice. And I got to tell you, I've learned a lot of the same things that he has based on him kind of like deciding to write it all down and like tell people about it. I'm fortunate enough that it's stuck around. Um, and I think the reason it has stuck around for over 2,500 years is because it is a shared human experience. And if you are paying attention, a lot of these ideas you will notice. And you will see it if you are present enough to be paying attention to it. And that comes with suffering, joy, all of it. We are connected. And I think it's a timely time to be talking about this because we have all these factions in this country. And I want, you know, I would love nothing more than for people to realize that we're one human family. We're all here. We're all in this together. And the best gift we can give to ourselves is to care about each other. Absolutely. So I think that it is very important to incorporate these philosophies no matter what your cultural background, because in this day and age, we are still, I read a quote the other day that said, we learn from history what we didn't learn from history. So it's like we're repeating the same cycle over and over again. And I remember being a child when I was in fourth grade, I remember sitting there and watching CNN. And I remember I got really into CNN for about two weeks. And they were like, and then these people are fighting these people in the Middle East, I think it was, you know, and then this is happening, then these people are retaliating and this. And I remember going, when is this gonna stop? 
When are mm-hmm. when are they just gonna stop fighting? Everyone keeps dying, and I I didn't understand. And then and then I'm thinking, you know, we were lo- for a while we were kind of in a little bit of a peace time before 9/11, and I remember being like, you know, remembering how I mean we're never really totally at peace. That's I'm this is not a political. I'm not a socio political geopolitical war expert. Okay, but we were at least sort of at peace for the United States during that time, even though we're normally doing something. Uh, and I remember it being such a kind of a peaceful time uh, in the two or three years leading up to 9-11, at least in my backyard. I w- wasn't being exposed to that. And I, I think this comes to kind of a universal teaching that people want to live their life without other people hurting them. They want to live their life. They want to eat food and walk around and maybe have children if they choose to. And live in a dwelling that is has shelter and have clean water. And this is kind of basic stuff. Now we've we've added a lot of needs to our quote unquote needs to our 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 uh, I don't know what you label it as, but our life here in the United States. Black Friday is coming. I didn't know if you knew that, but it's a very important holiday. Um, it, that's yeah, that's a I joke. Make all so. my presents. People. I know, and I'm, I'm not, and I, I'm not going to rip on. I'm not going to sit here and rip on consumerism. That's not what I'm here to do. But I think what we're trying to figure out is how can we, how can we use different philosophies and come down off our high horse and agree on some on some basic concepts. So I wanted to read you some quotes. Okay. We're jumping into the lightning round. Do it. And you don't, you can't respond too long unless you're really loving it. But I, I like right. this one because. Um, Okay, there's two in a row I'm going to read. The only reason we don't open our hearts and minds to other people is that they trigger confusion in us, and we don't feel brave enough or sane enough to deal with. To the degree that we look clearly and compassionately at ourselves, we feel confident and fearless about looking into someone else's eyes. That's Pema Children. I love her. So I'm going to read this one next. No comments till you're done. If we learn to open our hearts to anyone, including the people who drive us crazy... They, anyone can be our teacher. Pema Beautiful. Children. Yes. I love that one. Uh, I don't want to get too verbose because I talk a lot. Um, <laughs> the only thing I would say is that it's important to differentiate between having an open heart yet also being discerning. So you can have compassion and be able to see and love someone even if they treat you poorly. Mm -hmm. Um, even if, you know, they've created suffering in your life, um, and hurt you, um, you can have all the compassion and love for them while still having a good boundary on and and being discerning on what, how close they're going to be in your life. So I, I think that those things don't have to be mutually exclusive. And I talk with clients about that all the time, actually. Absolutely. You can love someone from far away and you can have compassion on a, person who's committed great crimes from afar and because we have all committed at least some small crimes um and so yes just because these people that drive us crazy can be our teacher doesn't mean we go move in with them and let them continue to drive us crazy but we do we can learn from them so well uh, because they're us they're us they've had the same feelings as us they just made a different choice on what to do with it so i think you can see yourself and, and see that person as a teacher when you're like, wow, if I had gone down that road, I've had that feeling before. And I know how close I was to acting on it, and I didn't, but that person did. And I can relate to that, and I'm, and I'm grateful that I didn't do what they did with it. But I can have compassion for them, and, you know, that's their journey. Absolutely. And I so, well. <laughs> and so I hope they I, figure it out. I agree, yes. I hope they figure it out. Um, so there was... I was about to read another quote, but here we go. So somebody who told me about one of the practices they did on the road uh, when they're driving was that when when people cut them off, they used to cuss and swear and curse your family and how dare you? And I'm how do you you think you own the world? Like, what are you doing cutting me off in traffic? And then um, they made a choice that every time somebody cut them off in traffic from now on, they were going to assume the following. They were going to the hospital to see a sick relative. They had diarrhea and they had to hurry up and get to a gas station. Um, and 
or they were, you know, late to a wedding or a funeral. So that helped them humanize the other person because we've also always we've been the one who's cut people off. We we've, mm-hmm. we've stepped on people's toes. We've annoyed people. We've all done it. So we got to get off our high horse. But here we go. That's calls humility. We need humility. But I love this quote. We habitually erect a barrier called blame that keeps us from communicating genuinely with others. And we fortify it with our concepts of who's right and who's wrong. We do it with the people who are closest to us, and we do it with political systems, with all kinds of things that we don't like about our associates or our society. It is a very common, ancient, and well-perfected advice for trying to feel better. Blaming others, blaming, is a way to protect your heart, trying to protect what is soft and open and tender in yourself. Rather than own that pain, we scramble to find some comfortable ground. Hema children, again. Thoughts? Boy, you took my recommendation to read her. Um, yeah, I mean, when, the way I look at blame is that that becomes an external focus instead of an internal focus. It's like when we're too scared to look at ourselves, it's much easier to look at somebody else, mm-hmm. you know, and in psych programs, you hear about like internal versus external locus of control and, you know, right. Remember all right. that? Oh yeah. It's to me, it's the same thing. It's like, all right, if I'm too afraid to actually look inside of myself at what I'm bringing to the situation, because I don't want to face that. It's way easier just to focus on what everybody else is doing wrong. And you'll find it, too. Oh, you'll sure. find how everybody else is messing up. But there's a point where you have to look at yourself as well. And yes. say, okay, what do I have control over? What am I bringing into this situation? Absolutely. Um, I like this one, and I'm going to make a comment on it. Um, this is from Tick Not Han, if I'm saying that right. <gasps> yeah, Tick Not Han. When another person makes you suffer, it is because he suffers deeply within himself and his suffering is spilling over. He does not need punishment. He needs help. That's the message he is sending. So I, I, that, that quote literally reminds me of something that I think is probably, uh, I know it's in the Christian religion, love your enemies, love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, and I, I'm not sure about the Jewish religion or, um, other religions, but I feel like that's kind of a universal teaching. Um, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't uh, stop this person from harming everybody, but it is saying that this person is crying out for help when they're when they're making you suffer. What do you think? Oh, I totally agree. And again, we could probably do a whole podcast on that. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, again, it comes back to compassion for human experience, and I do think when people are hurting. Um, it's so painful to deal with yourself or what you have control over because you feel like you don't have any control that we lash out at others. And if we're willing to look at ourselves with more kindness and compassion and curiosity um, and accept ourselves for who we are with our faults and all and take ownership of our choices and realize that we're the author of our own story, I think it becomes a lot easier to be able to look to, at others and see that and realize, you know, that we, we all want the same thing. I, I always say to people, and I believe this, I think everybody does the best job they can with what they have available to them. What they have available to them. And just remembering that. I think that's very important. Um, as it influences our relationships with everyone, strangers mm-hmm. in the supermarket uh, to our closest companion or friend. Um, we often forget, especially with people that are very close to us, that they are doing the best they can that day. And often we react instead of responding and having a little space there. So and I just want to say one thing about this, too, sure. because I want to be really clear. Yeah. You're going to not be good perfect at this. All right. I have road oh, yes. rage. That's like the worst. I'm the worst. <laughs> I'm so tired. You want to see me not being mindful? Be in the car with me while I'm driving. I, I remember. <laughs> I remember. I think I still am going through some trauma. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> no. So, you know, and I actually heard someone say this and it actually upset me. I was at a mindfulness conference and someone said, if you're still finding that you have road rage, then you need more time on the cushion. And I got reactive in that moment because I was like, how is that not the most judgmental thing I've heard all day? Here's my thing. You're a human being. You're not perfect. We all mess up. Be aware of it. Be kind to yourself. Grow and learn from it and move on. Because none of us is perfect. 
you know, and I don't want this to come across as like, we're all going to be these enlightened flowing beings. And, you know, if, if I'm not, if I'm reactive once and I totally messed up and uh, it's like, no, it's just about being more aware of that, you know, and then it's like being compassionate about it. Okay. I'm working on it. You know what? If you allow yourself that compassion to work on it, I don't know, maybe you can allow other people the compassion that they're working on it too. I agree. Okay. Uh, Three more minutes here. I want to jump into one more quote was uh, the, there was, I, I was going to say I was reactive to something yesterday and actually I remembered, how can I do this better? Oh, do you need to check that? No, we're good. Okay. Let me start over. I was reactive to something yesterday and I remembered afterwards, I said, oh my gosh, I knew how to respond to that. I just needed to wait and be patient. But instead my motor mouth got away from me and I hurt someone's feelings once again. So we're not perfect. It's just trying to be aware and coming back to the, coming back to ourselves, just as we're coming back to the breath when we see thoughts go by. So I love this quote, generosity, love, compassion, or devotion do not depend on a high IQ. That's by Joseph Goldstein. Anyone can do this, okay? It just takes some slowing down and a little bit of practicing. Um, I've and so Joseph Goldstein is brilliant. Yes. I love him. I have so many other quotes, but I think we're running short on time. We so are, I want sadly. you to possibly tell us about Sippy Zuckerman in Seattle and how people can contact you and go see you if they want to hear you talk or see you as a patient. So my practice is notoriously very full. Um, I also, though, do a lot of consulting and speaking gigs. Uh, parent groups that schools have come and become in. I've worked with teachers um, I've done, and I've created mindfulness programs in, in an elementary school. Um, I train mental health professionals. Um, so I do a lot of consulting work, which I really love and, uh, trainings and presentations. So that is always an option with me. And I can just be found at my website, which is www.sivysukerman.com. Um, I am hopefully in the next year going to be offering online courses on teachable that is still in the works because I am not super tech savvy, but uh, that's a goal of mine and I have the content. It's just about putting it together. So uh, stay tuned for that. But if you want me in person, I do speak and offer presentations and help folks learn how to utilize some of these concepts in organizations or schools or families or all of that sort of thing. Excellent. Highly recommend Sivy if you are on the West Coast. She's worth the drive wherever you live. Um, and I, before thanking you for being on the show, I'm going to read one more quote as sort of a goodbye quote. Okay. So this is from Jack Cornfield, again, from the Wise Heart book that I did read. An old Hasidic rabbi asked his pupils how they could tell when the night had ended and the day had begun, for daybreak is the time for certain holy prayers. Is it, proposed one student, when you can see an animal in the distance and tell whether, whether it is a sheep or a dog? No, answered the rabbi. Is it when you can see the lines on your own palm? Asked another. Is it when you can look at a tree in the distance and tell if it is a fig or a pear tree? No, answered the rabbi each time. Then what is it? The pupils demanded. It is when you can look on the face of any man or woman and see that they are your sister or brother. Until then, it is still night. Oh, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. I have nothing to add to that one. <laughs> I have nothing to add either. I just, I love that. I think that's beautiful. And I love Jack Cornfield. Oh, he's great. And I love that story. Yes. So, it's a great way to close. I like it. Awesome. It was great uh, having you on the show, Sivvy. I think based on this short conversation, we could probably do a few more episodes. So we might be seeing Sivvy here in the future or next time in, uh, either through the magic of Skype or next time in, in Seattle in 2018, I, we could possibly do a live interview. We'll see what happens. That would be super fun. You know I love to talk, so thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so do I. I think, I think we have that in common. All right. I do. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, and I did want to say, I wanted to say this on air for everybody to hear, that I think you have a really great radio voice. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate that. Yeah, and, it works. Uh, you sound good. Awesome. I'm proud of you, man. Thanks so much. I'm proud of you. So we'll talk to you soon. And this has been The Intentional Clinician with Paul Krauss with guest Sivi Sukerman. And 
And there you have it. This has been The Intentional Clinician with Paul Krauss, Licensed Professional Counselor. I am currently located in Grand Rapids, Michigan, where I have a private practice. I specialize a lot more on trauma and using EMDR therapy. And I do a lot of that as well as career counseling, solution focused, working with families and individuals. I do incorporate some mindfulness into my practice uh, in terms of using it as a tool to access some of the subconscious uh, and learning to write a new narrative. I am not an expert on Buddhist psychology, as you know, as Sivi is, but I was definitely inspired by a lot of the teachings. I do think they're quite universal and can be a very useful piece for us to learn more about as we're growing as people. Um, also in Grand Rapids, I have a supervision group where I help supervise limited licensed professional counselors, and you can find out more about that by going to www.counselingsupervisorgr.com. And I'm in a group office called Health for Life Grand Rapids. And in this office, there are several other clinicians. There are three female social worker clinicians, and they are awesome. They all have their own specialties. They are fantastic. And I have another male clinician who is very talented. And then we have a hypnotherapist, certified hypnotherapist, who is amazing. And two naturopathic doctors that are licensed in the state of Arizona and are able to give education here in Michigan while they're waiting for the bill to get passed here. So you can find out more about our group practice at healthforlifegr.com. That's www.healthforlifegr.com or call during uh, the weekday, we're in Eastern Time Zone, 616-200-4433. That's 616-200-4433. And we'd be glad to try to help you if we can. Or, and if we can't, we'll steer you in the right direction. So that is it. I'm going to be doing some more interviews soon. I'm going to be going to Arizona to do some trainings for a large behavioral health service organization, training them in the adolescent community reinforcement approach. I want to thank you all for listening. So far, this podcast, this is episode 11. We have had over 1,600 downloads, and I don't know who you guys are, so I would love to hear from some people. You can email me. Uh, my email is on my website, paulkrauscounseling.com, or you can also email me at my business email, which is intentionalgr at gmail.com and I would love to hear some feedback on the show you can also subscribe or rate the show on iTunes and that would help a lot going forward as I hope to continue doing the show for a long time and thank you all for listening I hope you've got something out of it and feel free to share it with friends and whoever you want the recording you just listened to consists of the personal opinions of Paul Krauss, and while these are based upon the literature he has read and his experience in the field, they should not be viewed as the de definitive opinion on the subject. Same with the personal opinions and experience of Sivvy Zuckerman. Listening to this podcast is not a substitute for treatment. If you are in need of counseling, don't hesitate to make an appointment with a local counselor in your area. And if you are in crisis, please call 911 immediately for the National Suicide Prevention Line at 1-800-273-8255. That's 1-800-273-8255. All right, everybody, be safe out there. Till next time. Say it again. What did you have that you liked so much? Oh, bibimbap. Yeah, what? It's like a, it's like a rice bowl. You make a marinated um, ground beef stuff that's really good. And then you do like the spinach salad thing that's heated with seasonings on it and bean sprouts and then other vegetables that you saute. You put it all together and then there's this gochujang sauce that you put on top. It's it's amazing. I We need to stop the interview now. I need to go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go get those tacos. So whatever volume you're talking at right there was perfect. So let's keep that. Cool? It will do my best.